may we become a sweet fragrance through our good works and actions. Hear our petitions and grant rest to our departed in your dwelling place of joy. O Lord our God, to you be glory forever.
putting on our Lord, as we have today in this letter to the Romans, chapter 13. But he also uses the image that on the day of our Lord's appearance, the day of judgment, the day of our Lord's appearance, he says, that we not be caught naked. So that is that night, that image of that nightmare. St. Paul uses as the image of the reality of what are we doing in our lives. We have time here below. We have a lifetime. Short or long. Perhaps for some too short, and perhaps for others too long. In their own opinion. But it's a moment of a question of conversion. And there is a predominance in this world in which while grace is present, light is present, there is still an undercurrent and in some instances a predominance still of darkness. This period of life that we have on earth is a question of time given to us for conversion, of turning more and more profoundly to God. And so this image that St. Paul uses of putting on clothing so as not to be caught out naked, is an image of the transformation of grace, of Jesus Christ's presence within us, that is offered to us. It isn't just done to us. We have to respond to it. The same way you have, may have a magnificent wardrobe. If you just get up in the morning and you feel frumpy, you either don't get dressed and you just schlep around the house in your frumpy clothes, or if you do get dressed, you dress frumpily. So St. Paul is saying that conversion process and turning to the Lord is to engage in order to put on something that changes us. When we speak about grace, grace is the divine touch within our lives. It's the divine presence in our personal life which modifies, changes us interiorly. So that's why St. Paul uses this image of clothing or also this image today of armor. Because it's something that we put on but the same way that grace doesn't become us, it modifies us. In much the way that clothing will. Clothing, my shirt, my, my cassock, whatever it is that I'm wearing, doesn't change, doesn't become me, but it does modify the way I behave, the way I hold myself, the way I speak. So it's very external to us, but it still modifies the way I behave. If I walk around frumpy, I will be acting in a frumpy manner. If I dress up nicely, then I will behave in a different way. And so the same way St. Paul is using this very much of an external image, but grace does the similar thing. It transforms us interiorly. It never becomes me. It's always distinct from me, but this modification does transform me. And hence these images that St. Paul is using on the question of conversion, this morality. And this morality of grace is rooted in divine charity, love. Now over the weeks I've been trying to write about charity in the bulletin, and it's going to go on for weeks because there's a lot to say about this magnificent virtue of love. But it is the radical presence of grace. If grace is present in our lives, the divine love is present in our life. If divine love is absent in our lives, grace is absent from our lives. It's not completely identical, but they are indissociable. They must be present together. So what's happening in this chapter 13 of the letter to the Romans is St. Paul, in the context of the beginning part of this chapter, he's talking about civil authorities and law, stopping at the red light, paying your taxes. How do we see these things? St. Paul is dealing with in the first seven verses in this chapter of how we look at civil law, this world here below. Because of course, the Christians in his writings were in Rome, they are a tiny, bitty, like minority. There's probably just a few hundred, maybe a couple thousand at most at the time of St. Paul in Rome, in a city which at the time of St. Paul had a million people in it. So this is a drop, proverbially, the drop in the bucket. There's just like nothing there. So St. Paul is trying to describe to them how do we see living in a pagan world. Now, sadly, they're very appropriate for us because we're returning back to 
of that pagan world mentality with a little tiny drop of people who embrace the gospel. And so we're surrounded in very much the same image that St. Paul is writing to. And he talks about the fact that we have obligations, we have to follow the laws, we do these things, but that's a question of justice. Which is why he then comes to this verse 8, and he says, but really as Christians, you owe no one anything except love, charity. That's your real obligation, your strict due. And it's something that we always have to pay out, something that we are always given the ability to pay out, and it will never be paid in full as long as we live on earth. Now, it doesn't mean we have to be running around becoming neurotic, doing every single thing we can, which is good, but it means we have to be disposed to show that charity to our neighbor, and especially amongst them who are in true need. That's the disposition of the Good Samaritan that we have in the Gospel today. Now, when he talks about this, he's telling us that love makes us transcend. It's not merely the red light and paying my taxes. And it's not merely the person who lives next door to me to make sure that I don't run over their petunia patch or destroy their fence. Because what St. Paul is also reminding us, he's echoing the Sermon of the Mount. And when our Lord in chapter 7 of the Gospel of St. Matthew, he gives what we call the Golden Rule. But sadly, the Golden Rule of these days is often portrayed as something negative. That you don't do to others what you don't want them to do to you. But that's not what our Lord taught. What our Lord says in the Sermon on the Mount is, all things, everything therefore whatsoever you might have other men should do to you, do you also to them. It's positive. And most of us would rather go through life probably not simply being ignored by everyone. That's the negative way that the golden rule is often portrayed. In the modern world, in this kind of secular and post-Christian world, the idea is as long as what you want to do doesn't affect me and my house and my life, fine, do whatever you want. That's not what our Lord taught. Our Lord taught us the question of love and beauty and virtue and nobility and honor. And so it becomes that the things that you would have others do to you, do you also to them. And then he says immediately, this is the law and the prophets. So St. Paul is just echoing the Sermon on the Mount when he says, look, focus on this presence of charity. Love makes us, because love makes us transcend out of ourselves. That post-Christian pagan way of portraying the golden rule, don't do to others what you don't want them to do to you, is so focused upon me. It's focused upon my concerns and my interests. But that's not love. It's self-interest, self-love, but it's not love. It's not charity. Charity turns us out toward the other. And so St. Paul uses this term of saying, Oh, nothing to anyone except love. That thing which transcends and makes us turn towards the other. So you'll notice that what he's doing is he's answering the question about the civil law. What do you do? Well, you do these things, not because Caesar will put you in prison. You do them because your inspiration in life and the presence of the divine love and grace in your lives make you greater than even the civil law. Because you're pursuing virtue. You're pursuing something which is in the virtue and the imitation of our Lord, this divine love. And then he says immediately, and remember that the policy is coming. Our Lord is to make his appearance. And so this divine transcendence of charity is not just because we're living in this world, but it's also because our Lord's manifest presence, which is coming. Which is why he says that remember that the day of the appearance of the Lord is closer than we first believed. Whether it's by, in this case for St. Paul, for most of them, it's their conversion as adults. But the day of that conversion, the great, the moment that I became serious in my spiritual life, 
The day of our Lord's appearance is much closer than that day. Time has flowed by, meaning that not only my death and that appearance of our Lord at that moment, but also the day of judgment, both of them are closer now. Live in this awareness of the transparency and the passing of time, he says. And when we do that, then we realize I only have so many days here below. And my desire is to fill them with virtue and honor and nobility and charity and doing to others what I would like them to do to me. It's a very easy understanding. It's extremely hard to put into practice. Because we all have our moments when I don't really want to do what I'd like to do for this other person. I'd rather just poke them in the eye. Or kick them in the shins. Or just ignore them. Or do whatever. But our Lord says it's always going to be a failure on the part of the Christian. Because God is giving us the potential by this grace to do so much more. So love requires a conscious engagement. I have to be awake. That's why St. Paul says, now is the hour for us to awake from sleep. I have to be engaged in order to practice love. Love doesn't just happen any more than salvation just happens. And so St. Paul is saying, we must wake now, because the hour of our Lord's appearance is closer than when we first came to believe. But love also means that we have understanding and compassion. Because we understand that in our heart of hearts, the other person is just as wounded and just as much, at least in moments, an idiot as I am. I make mistakes. I do things wrong. In quiet moments in my house, I may reflect on it in the evening, saying, I shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have acted in that way. And in our heart of hearts, we realize and if we have wisdom, we try to change it. If we don't have wisdom, well, then we're the same jerk for the rest of our life. That's just the way it works. So it requires consciousness and engagement. And that self-awareness in the act of charity, in the act of love, means that we also have compassion. And that we have understanding in order for us to be able to accomplish the good. So that what in the end, what St. Paul is telling us is that we are children of the light. That there may be darkness in this world. But we have someone, St. John, St. James will say, or St. John will say, that the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. That God working within us is omnipotent, infinite, hidden divinity. Working within us is much stronger than any kind of human frailty, human stupidity, demonic forces around. They're all much weaker than the one who works within us. Therefore, we have to have hope. But at the same time, what he's saying is that it's a conversion, something that we're always turning towards our Lord, always this movement, which is why he says, therefore, put away the works of darkness. All we have to do is think about human life. You know, we're 22, we're in college, we can't, Friday night, let's, we live for Friday, the weekend, what are we going to do for fun? You know, and when we're young, it's 10 o'clock at night, it's like, okay, well, what are we going to do tonight? We start calling up friends, where are we going to go, what do you want to do, where are we going to hang out? Now, these days, probably for most of us, by 10 o'clock, we're, we're already in bed at 8.30, right? So life changes. But what St. Paul is pointing out is not the changing of life, is that this idea of the night and the darkness. What do we do in the evening? Yeah. The morning sentinel seems to be highly attracted to Stormy Daniels. She's had a number of articles, at least two articles, about her performances in May coming up. Now, you obviously know what these performances are, you know, not high cultural, theoretical class. But you also see in the articles that her performances are at 10 p.m. and at 1 a.m. the night, which of course is totally appropriate. If she were to do what she does at 1 a.m. and 10 a.m., you would be repulsed by it. So St. Paul is reminding us that we are children of the light and we have to act as in the light. So we put on the armor of light because this is a combat. This is not easy to do this engagement with divine grace and love. And 
he uses that image to put on Christ. And I'll leave you with one last little story. This text is very important in the history of Catholicism for the conversion of a man, St. Augustine. And St. Augustine, from his early 20s, mid-20s, he's very successful. He's brilliant, he has a great government job, he's one of the public officials for the imperial court in Milan. He's in Milan. And Milan is beautiful. Milan has always been a beautiful city. And he lives in Milan and he has this, he's working on his second girlfriend. He doesn't think being chased is possible. He's shacked up from the age of 17 with one girl. Mom intervenes and gets rid of her, sends her back to North Africa. And then he's like, well, this is impossible. Because he's got to set up for another marriage, but the girl's too young, so you have to wait until she's marriageable age. And so he goes and finds another girl to shack up with. It's pretty pathetic. But what's pathetic about it is he realizes that it's pathetic. That why can't I control myself? I know that I could do better than this. Why am I not doing better? And when he writes about this later on, for years this goes on within him. He knows all the theory about wisdom and philosophical pursuit of these things. His mother is baptized. She's Catholic, St. Helen. But he himself is not baptized, and he keeps wrestling with all of this idea. I can't control myself. I've always got to have a woman in the bed next to me. I can't deal with this. I love the, the, the benefits, financial, and the acclamations of the world. I love all of this. But in the end, they don't mean anything. Can't my life have any more meaning? And it comes to a climax when he's finally 33. And he has his buddy with him, Olympias. They're both from North Africa. They've both been friends throughout their whole lives. And Olympias is like the number two friend, right? So Augustine is the one who's always like, why are we doing things differently? Why don't our lives look differently? Why don't we? And you can imagine Olympias looking at him going, I don't know. You want another beer? <laughs> and so it comes to this moment when Augustine is, over these years, been thinking about it. And in the house, in 387, we know exactly when this takes place. Not necessarily the day, but we know the year. And he's in this house, and he's discussing with Olympus, and he becomes so overworked by this. After years of this consideration, why am I so pathetic in making my choices? And he loses it. He becomes completely overwhelmed by this psychological and emotional crisis, and he gets up and he goes storming out of the house. And Augustine goes out into the garden behind the house, and he throws himself on the ground, and he's thrashing around under the ground. Well, Olympias just goes out, and, and he sits on the bench there, watching his friend lose it. He doesn't know what to do. And St. Augustine says later on, in the midst of this, he heard this little child's voice, a sing-song, a game being played on the other side of the garden wall. Tole legi, tole legi in Latin. Take and read, take and read, take and read. And it's like, he's, I don't recognize this game. But he, at that moment, that struck him. And so he got up in this midst of this emotional, disaster. And he goes into the house and he picks up the book that he has there. And the book he's always had with him, they're the letters of St. Paul. And he just flips the book open in the midst of this crisis. And it falls directly, his eyes fall directly onto this text that you have today from the letter to the Romans. And, what he, and specifically what he reads is, let us walk honestly as in the day not in rioting, not in drunkenness, not in lasciviousness, not in impurity, not in unchastity, not in contentiousness and rivalry and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said that that moment, his entire life was transformed and he was at peace. And he put that book down on open still, put it down on the table, and he sat down. And it was the moment of the transformation of his life. 
And the Libyans thought, what the heck did you just read? And so he looks, and he sees what for us is numbering is now the beginning of chapter 14. So just a few lines after, he reads to himself, now him that is weak in faith, take unto yourself. And he attributes that now to himself. And so the two of them at that moment, after years of this anxiousness, and this confusion, and this desire to do the better thing, are transformed in a moment by grace, conversion. And so it's something obviously rather dramatic in the life of St. Augustine. But is what St. Augustine, what St. Paul is trying to tell all of us to do. Not put yourself into an emotional frenzy, but to realize that grace transforms profoundly and dramatically. And to put on this armor of light, be ready for the combat and difficulty of the powers of darkness around us, but realize that the light is possible to transform us in showing this love to all and to transcend. And that's why St. Paul says that love does no evil. The commandments of you shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. Well, the person who loves isn't going to do those anyways. Even if those commandments didn't exist, they're still not going to commit adultery or steal or lie. They don't need the commandment because love has made them go higher, which is why our Lord says in the Sermon on the Mount, and why St. Paul says in this letter, chapter 13, chapter 8 to the Romans, love is the fulfillment of the law. Learn to love, and you'll do everything. Civil law, law of God, it will all be accomplished because we will be living and move towards a transcendent level. And that's why St. Paul finishes with the quotation today. Therefore, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and do not worry. Do not make provision for the flesh, for human nature, and all of its desires. They are beneath your concern. Focus on Christ. Put Him on and live within this light as children of the light within divine charity. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
shed the sacrifice and grant us the gift of your Holy Spirit. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with pure hearts and divine love, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Make up the sale. 
we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, civil leaders throughout the world, that they may stand for justice and establish peace. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, your holy church, that you established on the solid rock of true faith and send your vocations to the holy priesthood and religious life in a world of distractions which pull us away from properly loving you and our neighbor may those whom you have called to serve your holy church respond to you and have the courage to follow your will we pray to you o lord who pleased you from the beginning, especially Mary, the Holy Mother of God, and the prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors, John the Baptist, Stephen the Archdeacon, St. Joseph, St. Jude, St. Mary, St. Sharva, and all the saints. Assist us through their prayers and make us worthy to rejoice with them in your kingdom. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, Remember, O oh Lord, the fathers and teachers of the true faith, who have endured sufferings for the sake of your church and your people. May we truly and faithfully follow in their footsteps. We pray to you, O oh Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O oh Lord, the faithful departed who have left us and have gone to their rest for faith you, awaiting that life-giving voice calling them to Accept the offerings we present to you on their behalf, and have mercy on them in your kingdom. Through our Lord Jesus, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant grace, O God, to the departed, and forgive the sins we have committed, with or without full knowledge. Grant peace, pardon, O God, and forgive us of the departed, and so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things.
Deliver us from the evil one and from his deceitful ways. Do not forsake us, lest temptation overcome us. For yours is the kingdom, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord, bless your faithful people who bow before you. Deliver us from all harm and make us worthy to share in these divine mysteries with purity and holiness, that through them we may be forgiven and made holy. We raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. The grace of the most holy trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit. Let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility, and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One holy Father, one holy Son, one holy Spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth. To him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord our God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body. And our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for your life. O Lord our God.
us to drink the love of all people. Have mercy on us.
And then there'll be a little conference by the sisters and reflections. And then bring your, your bag lunch. We'll have a lunch downstairs. And then they'll do an afternoon uh, conference and then reflections after that. It's going to be based upon our Maronite liturgy in general, but specifically on our Syriac musical, the hymnody tradition that we have, the musical tradition for that day. And then, of course, Mass will be as usual in the evening at 4 p.m. So that day, September 29th, the sisters will be coming in on Friday evening, just driving in. Saturday the 29th, and then they'll be here in the morning of the 30th before they head back to North Dartmouth. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom we glory forever.